The Dublab Spring Membership Drive is happening now and throughout the month of May. If you enjoy the Dublab archives, help us continue by donating today and become a member. For more details, visit dublab.com slash membership. Hello and welcome to In Conversation, a Dublab podcast where each week we will bring you interviews from the Dublab Radio Archives. Hello, hello. This is Dublab.com, and we have the good fortune this morning to be joined by Harold Budd. How are you, Harold? Very well, thanks. Hello, Harold. Hello, Alejandro. (laughs) And uh, I guess I'd like to start off with saying that when looking in Wikipedia at your entry, it immediately says for Olympic rower, Harold Budd, please click here. Are you familiar with the Olympic rower, Harold Budd? Not a clue. No. So maybe that will be some uh, post-interview research we can all do together and (laughs) find out about the Olympic rower, Harold Budd. Maybe he rose across the plateau of Mir and we can (laughs) connect the two worlds. We're we're thrilled to have you uh, here in the Dub Lab studios. Thank you. Big fans of uh, your music for for many years. Many thanks. And uh, I guess, you know, one thing that I discovered upon doing just a a bit of uh, minimal research was that you actually um, were studying just down the street from the Dub Lab Studios at LACC many years ago. Yes, that's right. Yes. I didn't have a high school diploma. And uh, in high school, I was kind of incorrigible. In fact, all of my friends were. We, uh, you know, if you didn't know who um, Charlie Parker or Thelonious Monk was, you were, I mean, we didn't talk to you. Yes. Really horrible snobism. Bebop snobs. Yeah, bebop snobs, yeah. Just like, what is like, it's just a dreadful 17 year old brain. <laughs> it's just not clicking. I, I think it's, I think. Uh, I had probably, all of us had the same attitude at that age, you know, about music. Uh, I remember in high school being, you know, but yeah, that was a way of almost finding my identity and almost protecting myself from other things, you know? And it was identifying with certain groups and sometimes the more obscure, the better, or... I don't know. I don't... Maybe your analysis is very correct, but I, I can't buy into it. No, <laughs> no, it's it was just absolute thrill of um, uh, a kind of music that uh, just turned my world upside down. Thank God. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, that too. And you were out? Were you out in the desert here in California? No, no, I was at Los Angeles uh, High School. Okay, L.A. High. How did you get turned on all of those tunes? Uh, good question. I. Um, First of all, all my friends were uh, well. There's a there's a large black population at uh, L.A. High, and a lot of our friends were black people, and they turned us on to um, kind of music, you know, not not terribly interesting music to me, but anyway, it was part of the culture, you know, part of the vibe of being a failing student at a at a large yeah. high school in in Los Angeles um there was a uh, DJ named Joe Adams who in AM radio of course who played basically R&B you know doo wop that was you know that was his audience one day as four of us were uh, ditched school, of course, like we did every day, we went to uh, the beach in Santa Monica. On the way, I we had Joe Adams' program on, and this haunting, absolutely mysterious sound came out of the radio, and I, you know, I, I was transfixed. 
And I said to my friend, uh, his name was Mike Wattell, sitting next to me, I said, Mike, who in the hell is that? And he said, oh, that's Stan Getz, man. And I thought to myself, this is where I want to be for the rest of my life. I don't want to be anywhere else. I don't want to be in school. I want to be in this. I mean, it was like Satori. Wow. And it, uh, I still want to be there. I still get thrills when I think of what, what it did to me when I was just on the way to Santa Monica, you know, very innocent. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, your mind was blown on route to the beach. That's exactly. A pretty, uh, pretty it, good. It, it really was. And this is pre, pre Bossa Nova stand gets yeah. by a good decade at least. And were you checking some of these artists playing here in L.A.? Was the Central Avenue jazz scene hopping at that time? Yes, it was. Yeah, yeah, it was very definitely. And um, from since I was a, a new convert, shall we say, yeah. I learned everything as fast as I could. And there were um, so the Central Avenue scene was uh, like Sonny Chris playing alto sax. Um, who else? Harold Land. Um, hmm. Mingus was... Uh, Mingus uh, was playing um, uh, uh, bass with the Red Norvo Trio. Mm -hmm. And I saw him and the, and the trio, which was Tal Farlow guitar, at a small club um, off of Washington Boulevard near... Um, well, near Hoover, I think. Wow. Many, many years ago. Uh, but uh, it was, you know, transcendental. Yeah. Dexter Gordon. The show that you spend most of the show floating around the ceiling and then come back down every <laughs> once in a while, back in your body for, for time to applaud. Well, I got more sophisticated, and, and um, so I wasn't always, um, shall we say, I mean, I wasn't always in the same spot. Yeah. I learned... I learned different things, you know. Um, Dexter Gordon, Wardell Gray, wonderful. They used to have Battle of the Saxes in, uh, and they were, I mean, they were just great. Lawrence Marable playing, playing drums. Wow. Wonderful, wonderful time. I could never really participate in it because I didn't have the, I, I didn't have the chops or the mm -hmm. skill to do it, but I was... You skipped school enough. You you, you could have gone all the way. It's just you know. Well, yeah, I skipped school and uh, and then uh, worked at uh, Douglas Aircraft for a number of years. And at age twenty one, I quit and moved to San Francisco. And I was going to change my life there. So I got a job at Gump's Department Store. And uh, but that that didn't last at, at all. I got I ran out of money basically, and I came crawling back to Los Angeles. And instead of getting a full time job, um, I f kind of followed what my friends did, which was enroll at LACC. And I didn't know if I was going to be a painter or a well, not a filmmaker, because I didn't know about that too much then. Painter, composer, something like that. I'll try it out. I'll see what happens. And I took a class in Renaissance counterpoint. And I was absolute a whiz at it. I mean, it was just, I took right, jumped right at it. And harmony, and I thought to myself, well, I mean, I'm really good at this. Yeah. And uh, I was encouraged by a teacher to really get serious and uh, start composing. And he would, on the side, uh, critique my initial works. And they were extremely helpful. So uh, I never. How does that jump from jazz to Renaissance counterpoint? That's an interesting path. Um, it was. Um, uh, European Harmony and uh, Renaissance Counterpoint were, uh, in my estimation, of a rather deeper kind of brew, mm -hmm. and um, it, it and it attracted me. 
And were you opened up to it through the school there? I mean, yes. Okay. Entirely. That's not something you might stumble upon on a street corner. No. Before that, um, uh, what, what music class we had was not, nothing to speak of, but we were film fans and painting fans, uh, only because we read time magazine. That's the only place we could get pictures. And we all agreed on one thing, that there were two geniuses in the world, and they were Orson Welles and Jackson Pollock. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and Th- thank God for print media. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, do you stay in touch with that teacher? Or do you, was that the here? dead? Oh, no, but, but he's uh, at, do you uh, still stay in touch with him? <laughs> no, my, my question was that did, did they, uh, do you continue or did they see your career progress as they did. the years went by? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's my great. Question. Yeah, they did. And um, two years of that, working part time, uh, keeping myself together as much as I could, uh, I was drafted into the Army. And um, being a poor person, that's what happens. Mm. You, I mean, poor people went into the army. They had no choice. They, Uncle Sam just reached in and pulled you out of the, pulled you out of the crowd. It was the best thing that ever happened to me anyway. The best thing? Yeah, absolutely. Wow. How so? Well, once, once the um, basic training was done, all the shooting and the running and and you know physical um, bodybuilding and all the all that stuff. Um, I went into the army band, and most of the people there were um, had were, were music teachers or professional musicians, and I learned a great deal from them. Just they they showed me a lot of stuff. You know that's normal normal behavior and uh yeah being in the band did that mean that you were excluded from some other duties did that fulfill some obligations that (laughs) otherwise you you weren't peeling potatoes no no none of that and once a month the army band had to go to rifle practice and boy, the streets cleared. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> Drunks and junkies. Yeah. <laughs> a little more, try a little more staccato, boys. And I was reading that uh, you were in an army band for a bit with Albert Ayler. Yes, I was. Wow. Yeah, yeah, he was, um, yep, yep. And he was doing exactly what he was became famous for. Wow. And he, yeah, he was uh, wonderful. <laughs> some, those are some secret transmissions, I guess. They're still trying to decode those. Yeah, yeah, I know. I got the box set of um, uh, Revenant Music sent me the box set. And uh, I listened to them for the first time in many, many years. And uh, holy smokes, I mean, it's, it's, still, it's still there. Much more than, much, much, much stronger presence, I think, than Sun Ra or mm. even Coltrane, I mm. think, in my judgment. How was it uh, connecting with these musicians that had come from? Oh, oh, the, the, the musicians in the army band thought he was nuts. Yeah. Almost to a person. Maybe, maybe three or four, you know, kind of got the idea. But, um, yeah. I remember talking to uh, Eiler once uh, over lunch, and he said um, he really uh, respected, liked um, Ornette Coleman the best. Mm. And I, well, yeah, that's, I got it. I understand that part. But I said, what about, um, oh, Coleman Hawkins and, you know, that, that school? And he said, he just dismissed it all. Them old guys, they have no value to him, whatever. And I thought, oh, this this is really cool. Wow. And did you guys have access to records? Were you picking up records while you were in the Army, mail order, or hearing it on the radio? No. 
none of that, nothing at all. Eiler and I formed a trio, and we played downtown downtown Monterey at various clubs uh, during the uh, we, on, on the weekends because mm. we had the weekends off. I certainly had the weekends off. I had my own, I had my own uh, apartment uh, away from the, in Pacific Grove. So I was totally free of the army, except wow. except I had to show up <laughs> for work. Yeah, put that uniform on. Yeah. And um, was do you think that was the uh, fastest? the period where you played the fastest music in your life? Because maybe your trademark music is a lot sparser. And oh, I see what you mean. Well, that, well, I mean, all of that predates everything that actually happened by so long that I, mm-hmm. I don't think it has any relevance at all. Yeah. I don't, I, I can't, I can't say that. Uh, There's no recordings of that era at all or any of it. No, there isn't. There, uh, no. No, there isn't. Um, I would like to think the Army Band uh, played for uh, Salinas Radio once a week, and I'll bet Salinas Radio somewhere in their archives has uh, has uh, at least this tenor sax solos by Albert Eiler. I used to find music in the library that no one ever touched, like from by Aaron Copeland and Darius Mio, Vincent Persichetti, and several uh, William Schumann, you know, kind of Americana type, except for Mio, Americana type uh, American composers uh, of the of, of that school. Mm. It was kind of a really lovely music compared to John Philip Sousa for God's sake <laughs> when, when, when you say that uh, that Al- Albert Eiler was uh, seen by the other members of the army band as not uh, just plain lights uh, were they have similar thoughts about you or, or you know I, d- I, I, I didn't have a presence at all I mean I, d- I didn't have a style I, I, I didn't have I mean I wasn't a composer I was I was learning I see I was, I was a neophyte yes and you I, were playing drums. I was playing drums. Yeah. But, but I find it interesting that after that you did form a, a, a trio with him, meaning that the people that had certain values of music or certain common understanding and, and appreciation for a certain type uh, ended up connecting somehow, and he ended up playing with you, which other people in the band would have put a stay away from him. I had pretty much divorced myself from bebop. I I I, mean, I just reached a point where it 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 didn't um, it didn't go far enough. It was just it was just uh, kind of white white bread yes. in the in the jazz world. Mm-hmm. You know, I you know, oh God, what a, another album by Count Basie or um, you know, however good a player Lou Donaldson was. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I've man, I've heard it. I really have heard it. And being up north uh, in the Bay Area, did you see, I know, is this mid-60s, late 60s? 60. 60, okay. So it was a er, early. early. You were getting bored before <laughs> people <laughs> provided you with the sounds you were craving, I guess. Right, right, so right. So you are ahead of that curve. <laughs> um, and then you cruised back down to L.A. after the Army? Yes, I uh, f- uh, wanted to finish uh, school because I knew I was going to be poor for the rest of my life unless I did the very practical thing of finishing my education, which I did. Was that a GI Bill? No, there was no GI no. Bill. <laughs> was no. do- dollar Bill. <laughs> yeah, the dollar <laughs> Bill. And then um, I got a, a full scholarship to USC, and uh, that's when I discovered... Uh, well, no, it was before that time, but I became uh, a real fan of uh, Morton Feldman and John Cage. And most composers of my generation, if they weren't academically inclined and were more into art music, shall we say, uh, Cage and Feldman and Earl Brown and that school were were beacons of light. I mean, this is 
the way anyone with brains went. Mm. I certainly did. How do you discover them uh, at the time? Yeah, right. I I uh, <clears throat> I had a teacher in in school. Uh, it was called Valley State then. Now it's called Cal State Northridge. Hmm. Um, and he he really turned me on to uh, Cage and and that group. And he brought Cage and David Tudor for a concert. And it was called it was a lecture concert called Where Are We Going and What Are We Doing, which is reprinted in uh, Cage's book Silence. And it was about well, an hour and a half long and just ruffled everyone's feathers, so to speak. I, I was entranced. I thought, oh, Christ, this is, I get it. <laughs> so you were always gravitating towards the weird stuff. <laughs> yeah, Albert. All right, John, come on. <laughs> Give it to me. <laughs> I guess so. I he was exposed so. to too much radioactivity in the Army, I think. <laughs> Anyway, that that was my introduction to Cage, wow. and, um, and when I went to USC, I had studied with a, a great, great classical uh, composer and teacher by the name of Ingolf Dahl, hmm. and uh, he just gave me free reign. He said, "You do, you know, you're, you're. I, I don't, I don't know what you're doing. Yes, have a good time, you know, and do it. I, I'd love, to, I'd love to look at it." So let's let's keep it up, but you know you don't have any assignments. You're not going to write a fugue. You're not you're not going to analyze Brahms. Hmm. I know you're not. I said, well, you're absolutely right. Yeah, well, I won't. Wow, that's great to have that kind of yeah. Open he was great. Terrain. He was really great. Yeah, and he helped me. I had so much trouble with uh, tricky notation because uh, I mean it's. You know, it's a thing with me to be accurate hmm. when I did write music. And uh, he he cleared up a lot of uh, just, uh, oh, he cleared up a lot of issues uh, for me personally. How you, how you're making, how you make yourself clear without compromising what you're after. And there are ways of doing it. And he always found the way somehow and said, well, try it in this direction, for example. And by golly, more, more often than not, he was right. I could do it. And is that making yourself clear to yourself? Yes, or? yes, yeah. yes, yes. Whether it's clear to uh, other players, <clears throat> uh, it's open to question. Hmm. Probably not. Uh, you know that uh, classical music students are notoriously thick. <laughs> and when you were at USC, were you composing it with some of this music being played by fellow music students? Did you have some ensembles that were performing? No, no, no. no. I was um, the one thing I did was. Uh, I wanted to write an orchestra piece before I was 30, one, and I did, and it was the only one. And uh, Ingolf con conducted it with the, uh, with the orchestra so I could actually hear what it's like. That's great. Yeah, it's wonderful. Sometimes it can seem like experimental architecture where it's not homes that you can actually live in, sometimes compositions that you can't actually Yeah, experience. yeah, 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 that's right. Oh, and yeah, yes, some of them are wonderful. I, I really got turned on for a while by Giannis Zanakis mm -hmm. and his yes. unplayable cello yeah. uh, solo piece. And I, I didn't care if, you know, I didn't want to hear it. I, yeah. I wanted to see it. Yeah. I mean, it was, uh, it's so utterly remarkable. And in L.A., there was uh, some experience or opportunities. I know that there was like kind of West Coast fluxus folks and different. I, I don't know exactly, but were there some good opportunities to be able to connect? Like you mentioned at the university, you know, going to this cage performance. Was this a happening scene or were you plugged into these different pockets of experimental composition and performance? There was no 
There, there wasn't any. Mm. It was in the jazz world. Okay. Charlie Hayden and, and uh, Paul mm. Blay and, and that, uh, and, but, but no, no. Wow. Wow. And we're still talking about 1960s, uh, 60s, 60, yeah, 61. 61. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. I know that later on, in uh, towards the mid-60s, uh, UCLA had an interesting uh, yeah, they did. of uh, a music laboratory. They said... By like, Lucas Foss. Yeah. Doug, that was good. D Douglas Leedy. I don't know if you've heard. Mm -hmm. There's another one that I discovered by pure chance. And, and just reading the, this, you know, the story behind it. And, and I can imagine it was a pretty vibrant place with, full of ideas at the time. I'm sure it was. USC was not one of those places. USC was. No. I, I don't mean to, to be um, you know, nasty about it or anything. But they attracted a different kind of student. Yes. Generally, and probably still do, but I don't know that. Yeah, I, I, I think it also probably uh, goes in waves. You know, uh, there's um, yeah, a few, yeah. Sometimes you see uh, folks from different uh, college stations. You know, in one year it could be absolutely amazing for one or two years, and then kind of the change of guard. You know, and may not be as exciting, and then goes back. You know, I, I, I imagine I didn't go to USC, but or for that matter, any college. But, you know, when Double Up was created, it was really by this great group of uh, folks. Uh, yeah, yeah, so. I, I, I know, I know. This is, the, this is, this is the big change in, in Southern California, as far as I'm concerned, is that there's a, a community of like-minded people. But in my, in, in, but no, that never, never happened with me. No, I was, I was, I, I, I had to leave here to, get anything uh get anything happening at all where did you go london wow is that where you met you know priors all those folks or was uh, that later i met them um 10 years before i actually moved to london i i was um i was teaching at cal arts for the its first 6 years 1970 to 1976 so that was I mean, Cal Arts was incredible. The people who were there at that point. That's I mean, right. That yeah. must have been so like was, finding. It was Nam, Nam June Pike. <laughs> this and family. Morton Sabotnik. Yeah. And, yeah. Was Baldessari there too? Yes, yes, he was. Wow. <clears throat> and so, anyway, 1976, I left because uh, Eno and Marion Brown mm -hmm. told me that I had no business being a teacher. In, in a in a good way, or? In, a, in a really good way, yeah. Like uh, you know, like what are you doing there? You know, yeah. had they heard some? Absolutely, uh, Eno Eno had uh, heard um, uh, a tape, a performance tape, mm -hmm. and he was uh, going to bring me to London to uh, record it. And uh, Marion was going to be the sax player on one of the pieces. Right, so I went to London in '76 with uh, with Marion, and we recorded. And that that album is, uh, incidentally, uh, the Pavilion of Dreams. Yeah, which is yes. amazing. <laughs> and uh, so, so I had this connection in England and returned a few times, um, and really got more and more interested in it and finally finally I got um, a call from uh, uh, Ivo Watts Russell who was okay. the four, owner of 4AD and he wanted me to do a record with Cocteau Twins yeah the that's actually I brought today the Moon and the Melody yeah, to that's right. uh, get it signed. Oh, cool! That's uh, right. you're you're speaking Ale's language here. <laughs> well, very cool. Any anyway, you you get the idea. And so, not only did I go over, but uh, I finished up an album to uh, go on EG Records mm -hmm. at the same time. So I had. Uh, um, which I recorded in Little Tokyo. And um, so I had both of these things going for me. And for the first time in my life, I, was, uh, I uh, well, shall we say, making a living. Hmm. 
off of uh, you know. Yeah, making that was living. the time where you established yourself. Yeah, uh, or your name was yes, recognized. Exactly, you were high in sales and performances. But it was in Europe and Japan. In America, I nothing is happening. Mm -hmm. I, it was it was it was all ridicule and you know like a soft and mm. you know all these uh, God God knows it really dumbbells. And how did you first hear? When you connected with you know, had you heard any of his music prior? I had not, yeah. no, but I heard it when, um, uh, in sitting in Eno's living room. What were your thoughts when you that was extraordinary? That long piece with uh, Robert Fripp uh, was it this part of the music? obscure, the, oh, the discreet music, or no, um, uh, uh, the no pussy footing, no, no. I think it's from another green world, um, but mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I, I I don't know. Yeah. Okay. I, I it, it'd be foolish to just keep mentioning names. I I don't know. Yeah. But I heard it for the first time, and I heard Gavin and uh, Michael Nyman for the first time. Did they have uh, that? Was that after the Portsmouth Symphonia, or were they? Still no, that? no. I no, no. The. The Portsmouth, uh, Portsmouth, Portsmouth. <laughs> Symphonia. Um, I never really cottoned up to that. Yeah, it's I, I, strange. I, I, <laughs> I, th I thought it was an interesting kind of uh, thing. Yeah. But uh, I didn't take it seriously, really. Yeah. Although well, I, I know Cr Christian Cardu would would have, mm. but but. That's but it seems like that was part of the MO somewhat is yeah. sort of not taking taking it seriously, but not taking it seriously. Yeah. It seemed a, a bit in that world. Um, whereas the, you know, I just in recent, maybe past two years, got into the obscure records releases and all the, the Jan Steele stuff and the, uh, oh, yeah. Robert Wyatt and, you know, and all those people. And that really kind of blew my mind. Yeah, that was really quite amazing. It was a uh, yeah. It's the first time that I had ever come in contact with any of that as well. And and when you were recording uh, with Eno, uh, or when you were recording making that record, um, it yeah. uh, was was that a how was the process in the studio? Was that a overall? Uh, uh, oh, uh, when you were talking about like you went to London to make your first record. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And how was how was the process in the studio? Where were you recording at a big big studio? Because these days is with technology, uh, you know, yes. it's very different. You know, the experience. It was there pressures of of time and and how was experimenting? Not really. Every, everything went, went went very smoothly. It was a large studio and had a lot of instruments in it and a lot of humans, performers. Yes, and. Um, Each piece was uh, rehearsed quickly and then recorded. And um, interesting, yeah. No, there was no hang up, and it was all done on two inch, uh, two inch uh, magnetic tape. Yes. Traveling at 30 inches a minute. Yeah. Okay. No, no I was one day since you hear. Uh, recently, I was uh, I read a book about the making of another green world that you mentioned, and and you know was saying that behind. The, the idea of that record that people would never imagine it was uh, so it could be it was pretty chaotic at the beginning and full of frustrations and failed attempts at getting certain sounds so um, and there was the pressure all the time of a big studio and having musicians so many times when I listen to those records um, I personally worked on music like that uh, but always in the within my bedroom you know with a computer without any pressures or You know, of, of just the way everyone it. does it these just days, except exactly, me. Exactly. Yes, and uh, and and so so I, I always wonder, you know, how how was generally no, your no, experience? it was a, a traditional uh, acoustic recording. Yes. Yeah, and people had notes to sing or play, and if they did it, if they did it right, it was a take. Mm. That's all. I think we right. did three or four takes of Marion's um, sax solo. Uh, because he, um, I don't know why, he kind of screwed up. But he finally, when, when he got it, he really, he, he really got it. And mm. we were all thrilled. So it wasn't like, uh, um, well, we would just 
record and then he'll overdub it. He said, I did, you know, no one, no one wanted that. We wanted the dynamic of the room and the other musicians interacting all together as, a, as an ensemble, and, um, which is very rare these days. In fact, right. maybe it doesn't happen at all. I don't know. And when you went over to London, you had mentioned prior that, um, you know, you hadn't, didn't have this community. I'm sure maybe at CalArts it was different, you know, connecting with people. There, there, there was a community at CalArts, but I, I, felt, um, I felt rather dissociated from it because I was into a kind of music that they weren't. Okay. And they were still in the um, uh, Cage or Lamont Young mm-hmm. world, and I, I wasn't. Yeah, I read an interesting quote that you, I think it was minimalized yourself out of a career. Or yeah, that's right. I did say that. <laughs> so you were going to the extreme and then, uh, and then I was reading that later it was kind of uh, grasping onto sounds that were pretty, sounds, your favorite instruments and sounds that were beautiful, exactly. choirs and harps. And yes. um, was that... F- was that more of a personal thing than... It was a completely personal thing because there was no... Um, uh, I, there, I mean, you know, my, my colleagues, except for the people in the painting and film school, really thought I was just selling out, you know, pop music. Mm-hmm. And um, so... Was it tough to kind of push those ideas and those kind of the academic world aside and, and do something for yourself, or was it more exciting? How, how were you feeling in that? Most exciting thing that yeah. you can possibly imagine. Wow. It was thrilling, absolutely thrilling. And in London, you had a community of people who were on who that same agreed, wavelength. Who agreed, who said yes. Was yes. it a bigger community than just in the studio? Were you, were you meeting people, you know, around town or concert venues or places? Well, I can, I can think... I, I can think of a small tribe, shall we say? Mm. There's there's uh, uh, Brian, uh, Gavin, Michael Nyman, and the three Cocteau twins, mm. and that was enough for me. I mean, I, I got it because this is this is this is what I wanted. Wow. Yeah. And what what were your influences uh, while you were there? Were you turned on to? Uh, whole set of music was pop music more of an influence uh not at all not at all no was well, it the music of that circle that was no no i just felt that um they they understood they 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 got it and i had to agree with them i i concur entirely with yeah. your f- <laughs> I, I agree that you agree with me <laughs> <laughs> were, were you a fan of uh, cocktail or are you a fan of cocktail twins very much uh, very oh much. sure sure yeah and I, I think we come from a world that when i when i talk about pop music i refer to someone like cocktail twins oh that that, <laughs> that yes. type of pop music of course yeah 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 so. And uh, <laughs> making that kind of that beautiful sound, and and it, I I'm, I don't want to be you know offend you in any way, but that that impressionistic kind of vibe. You know, you'd mentioned being into Rothko, and you know that I read somewhere as well that it was like this full blast of color, and that in your music right. you were trying to. You know, or, or maybe not in your music, but in general, kind of seeking this, how do you bring these things into the world of sound or, you know, this kind of feeling, at least. I think you're very, uh, I, th- I think you're on the right track. In fact, yeah, I, I agree with you on that. It's, uh, um, and, and still am, I'm uh, interested in the immediacy of it, uh, the non-analy- an- non-analytical aspect mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. uh of of art um, yeah. that's what I think yeah I could be shooting the shit but <laughs> I don't think so was that a, in a way a being into the immediate immediacy of uh, of art or music and yeah. and was that a, in a way the absolute opposite of what color arts was about yes yeah feeling visceral yes. <laughs> excitement I yes guess. yeah I was uh, hearing an interesting story. I was DJing recently for a screening of the film For All Mankind. And uh, it was the film that Ina did, the Apollo soundtracks. And uh, 
uh, the, all the Apollo missions, the documentary of the Apollo missions. And the director of the film was there speaking, and he mentioned that he went to go visit Eno in his New York loft when he was working with Talking Heads and, um, yeah. uh, you know, making all sorts of crazy pop music at that point. But he said that in Eno's loft, there was an, an anechoic chamber where he had kind of like essential oils there, and he was making mixtures of scented oils and then smelling them and trying to go compose a song or play music that emitted and, and was that same kind of vibe and feeling. Um, those are things that, that you, you know, obviously painting and art and everything, but um, things that, that really turn you on and get, get you started on that process into making music these days. Yeah, always has been, I do believe. Um for example, I've always admired uh, certain aspects of the um, Southern California art and space, I mean, um, uh, space and light mm -hmm. artist, because of, of the immediacy of, of what they're doing. It's, it, and it doesn't make any difference if it's artificial or, um, or arch, you know, kind of, or, or uh, gimmicky. It, none, none of that counts. It's, it, 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 I mean, it, it's just, it's there and you take it or leave it. You, mm. you, if you don't like it, you walk away. So what? But you, uh, but the, um, uh, the craft involved in doing that is completely invisible. Yeah. Which I like a lot. Yeah. You have to sometimes be willing, it seems to kind of burn criticism and, you know, just go yeah, forward yeah. and leave that behind. But you know, it's interesting that sometimes that stuff doesn't see, you know, it, it doesn't get the attention it deserves. Maybe the time it can be throwaway, considered throwaway. But, you know, when someone's doing creating a body of work that is, you know, they're feeling it, they're feeling in it, you know, and they're creating something that's really you know, powerful to them. It, it's after a while, it seems that people maybe come around and give them a museum exhibition or give them a proper place. But You might be right. <laughs> and you, uh, when did you move out to the desert? Oh, that's a, a difficult question. Um, but 1963. I, God, 203. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I was going to. I was going to say we're jumping. <laughs> Yeah, 2003. Wow. Four. 2004. My wife and I, we had a three-year-old child. Um, we decided to, we were living in um, uh, Los Feliz, and we decided to change our lives. Mm. Uh, sold our house. Lived with our realtor for uh, several months. Wow. And... Um, you, you can't switch realtors after that. You're pretty much <laughs> stuck with that, same, with that realtor. No, he's a really nice guy, uh, Barry Sloan. He's mm. a he's a art collector, and he uh, just you know let us stay until we found what we were looking for, and um, the place in the desert came up. Friends of family, friends of friends of friends of family. No one had ever lived there. Mm. And um, I knew about it. I, I knew I knew of the uh, architect Josh Schweitzer, mm. and uh, sight unseen, I took it. I said, "Yes, we'll we'll go there." And we packed up and went. And that's it. Unfortunately, after about six months there, it was time for our son to start preschool, and. I hate to be very judgmental, but that's the way it goes. Um, the schools, public schools in the desert, are at the very, very bottom of... I mean, you would never do that to a child. Mm. So we didn't. So he and Mom moved back. Mm. Where did they move to? Uh, Pasadena. Did they actually go back? I can't remember if they went... Back to no 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 they they went back to um, our old haunt before we were married when we lived together it it was Park La Brea uh, or uh, a fellow told me recently Fort La Brea 
Fort LaBrie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It is like that. Yeah. But it was right across the street from the art museum that I thought was very cool. That's and they have place. a great restaurant and bar there. That's great. Which I visited daily. Yeah. And um, and so you were making a commute between the desert and no town. no uh, and and then uh, and then I jo- not a commute exactly but shall we say a hiatus sure sure so I've been there off and on since um, since two thousand and four but it hasn't been steady mm-hmm. by any sure. means. But talk about California light and things of that nature. The desert seems to be that place that, you know, it's an immediacy of the sky and the ground, the horizon, the I have stars. to say that the uh, desert environment does not in any way inspire me to do anything. Really? Uh, really. I, I have no feeling for it at all. And why do you, what, what keeps you out there? I love the house. Yeah, and that, that was really? uh, that's actually something I related. I wanted to ask you: uh, Do you have a studio there, or do you no. have any setup to no. work, or no. you just love the place itself? Yes, the, the yes, itself. it's like living in a really, really nice work. Do, do it, you? Sorry, do you find yourself um, when, when you work on music? Do you feel like you need to be established at a place, or or it's um, you're the sort of person that could be kind of on the run, touring, doing different projects, and writing between? Um, I need to be alone. Need to, yeah. Yeah, and have time. Yeah. Yeah, and I have plenty of that at the moment. Yeah. If yeah. you could uh, lift that house up and drop it in another location, I, 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 I would go to that location. Yeah. Because uh, the ex- aside from some of the most wonderful friends I have ever had mm-hmm. who live there, uh, the place is um, is an absolute. I mean, it's it's nothing is happening. It's mm-hmm. it's not a it's not a first choice place by any mean. Yeah. yeah. Where where do you are you inspired by? I guess you know other kind of climates or environments, natural no. environments. No, oh. no, I'm not. Oh. No, I'm in, inspired by uh, I'm inspired by beauty, just like mm-hmm. just like anyone else is, like the. You know, the desert sunsets and mm. the dawns, they're, they're beautiful, of course, but they are in, in all, you know, a lot of places. Yeah. So. You're not going home and writing, the dawn today was beautiful. I'm writing a song called The Dawn Was Beautiful Today. <laughs> I'm writing a song called The Dawn Will Be Beautiful Tomorrow. You have my word, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> but you seem to be. Someone who the aesthetics also of art and composition, you know, you mentioned the house itself, you know, as being somewhere that, that, that keeps you there, yes, magnetizes you to the yeah. place. Yeah. Um, do you find it, you know, other, you know, that love of art, visual art, is that a connective thing with you, with your composition and, and that, or is it more just these feelings coming? I, I feel that there's a, a connection. Uh, I'm not going to be pretentious enough yeah. to say that there's a one-to-one relationship that I can draw a line yeah. from one to the other. But yeah. most certainly I feel very, very uh, cl- close affinity with, uh, with uh, visual arts, paintings mm. in particular. Can I ask you just to jump a bit uh, to, sure. to another subject? Uh, I, I I know that some of your work, especially the most recent one, has been out on David Sil- Sylvian's yes. label. Uh-huh. And uh, do you? Uh, what's your relationship with him? Was that something that he approached you to do? Yes. And that is, uh, have you guys worked, collaborated, or talk about collaborating? Yes, we have not collaborated, but we talk about it all the time. Yeah. Never yeah. happened yet. I, I'm a big uh, David Sylvian fan and also a fan of uh, his band, previous band, Japan. Uh, and and I always uh, found them, and I maybe because I discovered them at the same time, but Cocteau Twins and Japan, uh, I find them very similar in many ways. Uh, they do have a beautiful, lush sound. Yeah. And, and sort of, to speak, the uh, same kind of color uh, the music has. And uh, and I find it interesting that... that you know, you did a collaboration with a group like Cocteau Twins or Robin Guthrie and then uh, someone like David Sylvian and, you know. I think it's totally organic. 
I, I can't see how how it would not happen. Of course, it, it seems it seems inevitable. In, in in some way, I mean, we're all we're all grazing in the same side of the meadow. So it's not my imagination. That no, no, it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't think so. And that side of the meadow, you know, you mentioned earlier being being in that world that that maybe was a little more analytical, a little more academic. You know, doing the compositions and minimalist stuff, and then finding a point of closure with that. Yes. You know, and being done with that. Do you do you ever find yourself kind of getting to the end of, you know, this, Mm -hmm. Uh uh-huh. Um, yes, a little bit. Yes. Um, I don't, I don't take it too seriously though. Um, which is not to say that I wouldn't change my mind in a second if that's the direction I want to go in, Mm -hmm. but it hasn't uh, presented itself at all. And I, I don't, I don't take it I for for music and art and let's let's just say art generally that I really love I I've never changed my mind about it really I mean there might be emphases that are uh, somewhat different now and again but uh for example right now I'm just finishing a spring quartet of all things great and uh, is it, you know, is it, you know, how can I describe it? It's it's all it's all whole notes, mm-hmm. virtually, and it's, it kind of floats in the air. At least I hope it does. I mean, I I can't, I I, I can't play the parts myself. But. Even with your, you know, your piano work, it's there's something that I think one of my favorite things about your piano compositions and playing it's just that those long decays and hearing those notes really i love them too travel I, I, I love it <laughs> exist and ripple out there for example robin and i um just completed a tour of uh, and a recording in europe and uh we we don't even we don't even rehearse i mean it the minute his guitar is set up and a chord comes out, it's everything is so utterly clear. Mm-hmm. It's just so easy. And um, it's a little bit suspicious, you know, like, uh, hold, hold on, Harold. It's supposed to, it's supposed to sweat a little bit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> hey, <laughs> but you, I don't. You mentioned the, the <laughs> invisibility of the genius of painting, you know, or the effortless yeah, yeah. nature. Yeah. I guess you guys are pulling it off. Yeah, <laughs> I, we, we certainly are. And I, I just, you know, it's, um, I just have, I have not completely gotten over my Protestant guilt. Mm-hmm. You know, things are supposed to be a little bit difficult. And yeah. you're supposed you know, life is about solving problems. Yeah. And uh, I don't believe that for a moment, but there it is. You know, it's still. <laughs> yeah. Do you, um, and if if you weren't, you know, actively composing and touring, are there some other uh, arts or things that you keep yourself busy with that kind of give you that same amount of joy? If, if uh, listen, if I wasn't doing what I'm doing now, I I would... I would just, what can I say? I'm I'm such a fan of what everyone else is doing. Mm. I'd love to be a painter, yeah. But I I just I'd just be painting like Billy Al Bangston. I don't even know. I don't think I know. Well, you'll you'll find him on you'll <laughs> Google. You'll, you'll, you'll Google him. <laughs> what if I get the Olympic rower Billy Al Bangston? <laughs> Isn't that something? I don't know. I, I, no, I. <laughs> Well, of course, do I, I don't look at Wikipedia, so. <laughs> um, and, you know, you mentioned you're a fan of what other folks are doing. Is it that same circle that you mentioned before? You mentioned Eno and the Cocteau Twins and those folks. Who are you inspired by? Very definitely David Sylvian. Mm-hmm. I love what he's doing now. And what he's doing now is very, very rough. He's, he's, um, his, his last uh, album that I've heard is called Manifon. And he's using um, uh, musicians uh, fro- from, like, f- he's using musicians who were more from the free music uh, scene. And he's putting his um, his lyrics and his voice and, you know, his, we know what his voice sounds like, that the very feathery, sensuous sound. 
putting it to very, very rough uh, music. And I think it's a uh, tremendous uh, breakthrough for him. Mm. Where he's, he's, if he ever wanted to break away from being somewhat soft, you know, a little bit uh, uh, not so heavy, uh, he's done it. Mm. And I'm, I admire him immensely for that. I think it's a, a magnificent move for him. Plus, I like him personally, and he's, I've, I've always liked him as an artist. I don't know anything about Japan. I, I came on the scene long after Japan, so I, I don't know anything about yeah. the, uh, the music or, you know, I'm, I'm not uh, there. You might be, I know someone you could ask for a copy of one of those records I can probably you, pass you something yeah. you do that or it's just beautiful this guy named David <laughs> oh <laughs> nice <laughs> anyway you, you got the idea so I I, 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 I Sylvian snuck up on me um, uh, when I moved back uh, well when, 20 years ago I mm. guess so that's post Japan and are you listening to a lot of music you know when you're driving from the desert out here, do you are you avidly listening to? Only music? when someone sends me something. Mm -hmm. I I I the last time I've got a big package of music is mm -hmm. from John Fox, mm -hmm. and I'm a fan of his, and I listen. And but mostly I don't listen to music. Mm -hmm. I don't listen. I don't have a radio. I don't have television. Yeah. And uh, in fact, I don't even have. Um, uh, phone service or computer service at my you, house. You must love that house. So you look at the house all the day. <laughs> that sounds wonderful. This, this corner. <laughs> well, you know, I, you know, I'm not a monk, so <laughs> I have to, you know, I go for my lunch every day to the 29 Palms Inn, mm -hmm. and I have uh, a little bit too much Malbec during yeah. lunch. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and are, every day. Do you get a kick out of uh, performing? Do you enjoy, is that something you, you... I enjoy performing very definitely, but I hate solo performing. Wow. It, there, there's just, it bores me mm -hmm. senseless. In fact, um, I think it was two years ago, I had a solo concert at, uh, at Oxford University. Mm -hmm. And during the concert, I promised myself that I would never do this again. I was so bored, and I was so tired of my own cliches. And I, and I haven't done it since. Mm. But I love, I love performing. It's interesting. There is, uh, what was the record that, uh, was it The Room? Mm-hmm. There's, was it the room that was the kind of maybe secret recording of you playing piano, solo piano in your house? Who, oh, 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 that's, that's, uh, that's, uh, Dan, Dan Lanois. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's what record called, is that? Yeah. Good question. What is it called? Uh, La Bella Vista. La Bella Vista. Yeah. Cause that's a real beautiful record Thank you. and it's interesting and that's a solo performance, but maybe next time you just need to bring a tape recorder and play back. You know this, this this business about it being secretly recorded is is, is a bunch of horseshit. Yeah, is it okay? Yeah. That's oh, a good story. No, it's, it's, okay, yeah, it's a story, but it's not yeah. true. But to yeah. to record a solo, you know, a piece like that, um, you just you don't like performing in that I, manner. Yes, I I don't mind recording, yeah. but I don't like um, public performance. Okay, because it's just. Uh, I'm I'm not a whiz. I'm I'm not I'm not a performer. Mm -hmm. I'm I can only do in my little niche, you know, a shadow of what's happening in my little part of the world, but I boy, I can't uh I mean if I had the chops of Terry Riley or for example, or the beard. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that funny? I just picked up a uh, a copy of uh, original copy of Michael McClure's play, The Beard. Uh, the Beard. I haven't I haven't seen it. 
It's about Terry Riley's facial hair. No, it's about a uh, uh, dialogue between uh, Billy the Kid and Gene Harlow, mm. ah. and it's from the nineteen late fifties. Wow. Late fifties. It's a great play. Wow. Yeah. So. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> where weird. where were we? And I guess you know I was curious. This is. Uh, be interesting more a game than a question but um a game in question form mm. if you were kind of speeding away on a train leaving this universe and you had to toss behind you know one of your albums would you be able to choose which one you could leave for man and womankind to know you by one one of one of several, really. I I have a personal love uh, for Luxa, mm. and um, and I have a great love for um, the Serpent and Quicksilver, and I I think I would toss that one. Serpent and Quicksilver. I think so. Okay. Yeah. Toss it into in, in, into <laughs> into forever. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> toss it into infinity. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Great. Well, we're we're really thrilled that that you could join us. And, Very nice of you. Know, you. Thanks. Uh, share been, some yeah. some of your thoughts and. I've enjoyed it immensely. Yeah. Here I get to shoot the shit. Yeah. <laughs> Without if, pressure. If people want to, you know, connect to to your whereabouts, uh, whatabouts, and who's abouts, uh, what would you suggest? I don't know what they would want to get in touch with me for. <laughs> but just check new releases or anything, you know, what you're up to or concerts. See what kind of mall back you're enjoying this. <laughs> 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 well, I don't have an agent and I don't want one. Yeah. And so there, there is no clearing house, yeah. really. Yeah. Just kind of looking online or looking, keeping, That's, keeping tuned to the universe, I guess. There, there, yes, yes. <laughs> That's well said. Great. Well, we'll uh, we'll keep tuned and uh, hope to to hear a lot more in the days and years to come. Cool. And we really appreciate it. Thank so. you. Hey, thank you both very much. Thank you. It's been en enjoyable. Very, very enjoyable. Great. Thanks, sir. Cool. In Conversation was produced by DubLab, a nonprofit radio station broadcasting live from Los Angeles since 1999. Sound editing and theme song by Matea Bame. For more programming, visit dublab.com. And thank you for listening.